Hey guys, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program! My name is Twitchy, and for the past couple of episodes now, we have been taking these little green space frogs and launching them out of the atmosphere for fun and profit. Last time, our magnificent space program showed its might and resilience by launching a probe to the moon to gather altimetry data. There was a little bit of a navigation issue along the way, but with a quick corrective measure, we managed to get ourselves exactly where we wanted to be to collect all the data and plan to today's mission of a moon landing. Now I'm going to remind you once again that my name is Twitchy, and this is my final Kerbal career. As with any space program out there, we have a destination in mind, but we must secure our funding. Thankfully, the Kerbal Space Program base game comes with a very handy contract just to go and land on the moon. Also, searching through, I do find a plant a flag contract, and we decide to hold off on getting any more until we find the situational capabilities of the craft that we're going to design. Speaking of the craft, we're going to design a mission of such magnitude is going to need more than 30 parts. So we're going to set aside a small part of our budget, a small part being nearly about a quarter of our money, in fact over a quarter of our money, to upgrade the vehicle assembly building. This gives us access to 255 parts. That is a great number of parts that we should be able to do just about anything we need to do with. And that thing that we need to do is of course our first ever MUN landing. This is going to be a prestigious one and I want to take all three of my main Kerbals with me, Valentina, Bob and Bill. Using the um, onion capsule underneath, I, don't, I can't remember the name of the two-person capsule underneath, though if I did not have access to this particular DLC, I'd be tempted to use the uh, the passenger cockpit as it also has a capacity of two. I'm toying with the idea of having enough fuel to go to the moon and back just with this one stage, but then I think, no, no, no let's, let's separate some of these stages out. Perhaps these are the seeds of technology that will take us to higher gravity planets at some point. So what I'm going to do here, normally I would take my science with me on the landing stage, uh, on the, 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 the return stage even. Uh, I'm building a landing stage underneath. That's right, I want to have two stages, one to bring us down as I've put the landing gear on there, and that stage is also going to have a whole bunch of science parts on it so that we can leave those on the moon, and the original stage that I built is going to leave the moon and return to Kerbin with this full complement of fuel. Now, this is a little bit overkill for the moon. I am, I will quite readily admit that, but as I say, moving on to the future, uh, we are going to have to go to some higher gravity planets, and uh, actually, this just looks more interesting. As we move into the future and upgrade our various facilities around the Kerbal Space Center, we will be able to make lots more decisions like this. I find a bunch of adapters here trying to bring myself out to the larger fuel tank size that I have access to, and I do briefly play with the idea of using a single adapter, but no, I think this the double double curve look has got a much more interesting profile to it. The double adapter look almost entirely inspired by the Soyuz there. I, I don't know exactly, I didn't think about it as I was building it, but it must be the Thing that made my brain go, yes, this looks appropriate. Anyway, we carried on down with the two meter tanks here, and the first thing that I noticed very quickly was that I did not have a two meter engine. So, making myself a small little engine cluster out of some structural parts, a swivel, and a bunch of reliant engines there kind of makes the job work. They do stick out a little bit, but I'm going to use some fins to cover that up, and people will never notice the difference. Going to slap some solid boosters around the outside just to make sure that we can actually make it where we're going. And I'm seeing that my Delta V at the moment is five and a half thousand delts uh, for us to use. This this was not enough. Uh, I, I, I wanted a little bit more. I mean, technically, it was just enough to get us where we wanted to go. But I, I know what I'm like. I need some bigger margins than that. Uh, and we've actually pushed our rocket up to the size that the launch pad cannot support anymore. And this is set alarm bells ringing in my head. I know, I know. A 140 ton rocket should have more than enough fuel to go to the moon and back. So I do a little bit of a re rearrangement of my staging. And actually, not only can this craft go to the moon, but with eight and a half kilometers per second out of E, this, this guy could go to Juno. This could, this could probably go and land on Eve. It's, it's not coming back, though. Taking to the KSC launch pad for our most prestigious mission yet. Valentina Kerman are blasting her way through the atmosphere. Our most experienced pilot flying our two most experienced support Kerbals, the scientist and the engineer. You might have noticed that Valentina Kerman there hiding behind a veil of darkness. Some in the Kerbal Space Center say that this is to shield our eyes from her hideousness that she picked up when making a trade with some outer dimensional being to get as good at piloting as she is, whereas the actual engineers that put the craft together say that really there was just a bulkhead in the way of the camera and we're supposed to just ignore that. Controversy is rife. Who are we supposed to believe? How are people, right-thinking, reasonable people with an access to science such as we, supposed to know who to believe? 
We find ourselves above the atmosphere here, 75 kilometers up. We are five kilometers over the atmosphere, believe it or not. We are now 10 kilometers, and I am thinking about making a circularization burn. At the top of our screen, thanks to the Kerbal Engineer, and thanks to the fact that we've got Bill Kerman, a Kerbal Engineer, on board. Uh, the Kerbal Engineer is a mod that gives us a whole bunch of information at the top of our screen. I also have an option to bring up some other windows with some more information, but I find apoapsis height, time to apoapsis, periaps height, and time to periaps, as well as some uh, fuel readouts are pretty much all I ever need. On the right hand side we have some terrain readouts, our speed relative to the terrain, the biome, stuff like that. I find this very helpful for collecting the correct science at the correct time, also making sure that we end up in a very uh, nice and precise orbit with the apoaps and periaps. Anyway, we are moving around our orbit to try and find the point where the moon comes up just above the horizon. It's a bit hard to see, but it is out there. It is both the dark side of the moon and the dark side of Kerbin, but at our, what is now our periaps, we are burning until we can get our apple apps up to about 10 and a half million meters up there uh, it, it's quite a distance to go and it takes a little bit of time to actually burn off all our fuel as you can see i am using physics warp in the top left of my screen to actually times to the speed of this burn uh, we get up to roughly 10 and a half million meters as i say and this beautiful shot beautiful shot it's a shame that streamer me didn't think to hold on to the shot for a little bit longer as it would be on on screen for uh, more time than it was for uh, streaming obviously I do compress this footage somewhat but I was much more interested in watching the moon at the top of my orbit here I was very close to thinking that we were actually going to miss the moon that we were a little bit too far ahead but as we were just about to start falling back down the moon came along and found us uh, I was originally heading for the big crater on the far side of the moon uh, but with a little bit of a chat with the stream chat we decided that maybe that would be best to leave for a bigger mission and try and aim for one of the slightly smaller midland craters that are just ahead of it. The first burn in the moon sphere of influence got us into a nice stable orbit and now I continued on trying to find uh, the lowest pass I could possibly get over the top of the moon there. Whenever you are coming in for a landing on a new astral body I always like to get down nice and low so that when I am slowing myself down to come out of orbit and come into a landing I don't have to fight against the gravity so much we're like right there at the floor if I was really high up in the sky I would have to waste a whole bunch of fuel trying to cushion my descent. As you can see I'm coming in for my periapsis now and I'm going to just start doing a few targeting burns. I want to end up in that crater that I have pointed out with my mouse there a couple of times uh, and we look like we're going to be heading a little bit south. Another beautiful shot coming in, in over the moon and having a quick visual look at where the landing site is. I'm going to use the map view just a little bit more just to make sure that my orbit is going to come in and I normally aim for the other side of the crater as well as I'm trying to come in for a landing uh, I'm going to be scrubbing speed pretty quickly and I want to have enough uh, play in my orbit to be able to land where I want as opposed to if I tried to put my orbit exactly where I wanted to land I would then be slowing down that I would end up a little bit short. If landing on Kerbin under parachute is the most boring part of the game, landing propulsively on the moon whilst you are running desperately short of fuel has to be one of the more stressful parts of the game. The running desperately short of fuel is, of course, intentional. We don't want to be going and leaving a whole bunch of fuel behind us. But there we go. Touchdown has been achieved. We have landed on the moon for the first time. Valentina, the first Kerbal to get outside. Once again, her suit seems to be a little bit messed up. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I do tell you what's going on Right now, we are headed for a PR moment. We need Valentina, we need Bill, and we need Bob all to get down on that. Bob? Bob, what are you doing? Seriously, what are you doing, man? We're trying to have a historic moment here where we're all being, like, graceful and elegant and, like, heroes for the future. And you go, scrape yourself across the floor. Beautiful shot there. Lovely. The craft that got us here and the people that made it possible. One of the things that I wanted to do was bring some of our uh, science with us, but trying to figure out some of our ground-based science with us, sorry. But whilst trying to uh, m maneuver around the jetpack and the parachute and stuff like that, I realized that uh, Valentina didn't have the space for it. Of course, she needed needed to use her, her jetpack to actually fly up to her command pod so uh, that that wasn't really a winner to swap out talking about not really a winner bob has struggling a big time with his jetpack today he manages to collect all the science though uh, goes around places the first flag of the playthrough i think it is anyway we are calling it the site alpha and bob trying to play off his little bit of jetpack accident by asking 
Can we breathe the mun? Of course, Bob is actually the terrain specialist. If we think back to his North Pole days and the little adventures that he had over there, actually, this is fully within characters. After a moment's thought about which way is the best way to take off from the mun, we leave the Miroslav Hermanshevsky. Oh, God, got that name right eventually. <laughs> Memorial lander behind us, and we are off for an orbit of the moon. The first thing we need to do is try and get ourselves up into uh, the situation when we're not going to crash into the mountains of the moon. It's uh, a bit of a problem that can happen if you are not prepared, and so I must throw myself up to quite a high orbit. I am waiting until the craft here is on the other side of the moon. That is the side, that is the leading edge of the moon, the, moon, the side of the moon that is leading in its orbit. From there, I want to put push up the other side of my orbit on the p far side of the moon, the trailing side of the moon, uh, to be able to boost me backwards. This in effect slows me down from the moon's orbit and as we leave the moon's sphere of influence you'll be able to see that this actually gives me a, a beautiful little assist into the Kerbin sphere of influence and we find ourselves nicely in orbit. Using the Kerbal Engineer I'm going to try and bring myself down to a mere 40 kilometers. This puts us deep enough into the atmosphere that we're getting a pretty a good uh, aero brake assist situation on the go, uh, but of course uh, we don't want to end up so deep that we're just exploding the engines, exploding the fuel tanks, exploding the parachutes. That, that would all be very, very bad. I've been sat here trying to figure out the way to word this next little confession to you guys, but I'm just going to come out and say it. I don't actually know the ideal place to be aero braking in Kerbin. I have come back many, many, many times, but most of the time I've ended up going just a little bit too shallow through the atmosphere and ended up having to get my Kerbals out to push, or I've gone in so deep that we've ended up blowing everything up. Anyway, we are re-entering into the atmosphere. We have burnt through all our fuel and we are throwing the fuel tanks and the engines aside as we start coming through the fiery plasma that is our deceleration heat. I've never sat down and figured it out, but it's got to be a lot of energy that is shed during this particular process. I mean, it's, it should be fairly easy to work out. It's all kinetic energies, right? You've got kinetic energy in orbit going at 7.6 7 kilometers per second, and then you've got whatever kinetic energy you've got on the ground, let's say traveling at the speed of sound about 300 meters per second. Uh, that's, a, that's a big difference. Kinetic energy, like, squares your velocity, so th that those are big changes. ba na ba 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 da da Ba-da. And uh, one of the other things that never changes is how boring it is to fall through the atmosphere on parachutes. I may have mentioned this once or twice, but at least we get some explosions to listen to whilst they're on the way down there. That's pretty nice to see those fuel tanks land, actually. And a lot of the time, whilst we're just falling through the atmosphere, they'll despawn out in the middle of nowhere. Grab, grab ourselves some grasslands. Ah, we actually managed to land not in water, and it wasn't the science we needed. Talking of the science we needed, though, 303 science points earned. These are monumental figures. But of course it should be. We've just come back from the moon, the most prestigious event we could possibly have done for all of Kerbal Kind. Of course, the ribbons from Final Frontier, fully respecting the fact that this is such a monumental mission. First EVA on the moon, first landing for the whole bunch of them. It was pretty awesome. Going to the science. Straight away, I want the skippers. Let's not even joke about, we need some big engines, so I'm gonna go, and go ahead and grab those. I also grab uh, things like the miniaturized docking port and of course the actual full-size Clampertron docking port. These are very important because my next step in my tourist network is of course getting way stations in the form of space stations. Of course, these plans are merely aspirational pipe dreams, if you will, unless we can go ahead and fund our progress. The first thing that Gene Kerman is trying to hit quite heavily to me is the fact that we need to go to Minmus next. Minmus is the next moon out from Kerbin. We got Kerbin, the Mun, then Minmus. This seems like a good progression and a nice way to go, and I like to have altimetry scans for everywhere that I go to before I actually send my Kerbals. It'd be a little bit irresponsible to send people to places where you don't even have a that. So to that end, we have taken the Munich, the scanning satellite that we spent sent to the Mun before our landing today, and upgraded it to the Minic. This involves putting solar panels on every direction so that we can have omnidirectional power systems. One of the things that I love about career mode, as opposed to just going and playing in sandbox for all the time, is the fact that you can iterate over ship designs as you get more and better technology. Anyway, we launched the Minic today from the Cove launch site, only just for a change of scenery. It has to be admitted here. Uh, I did try originally launching from Woomerang, but that put us on an inclination that was just too far removed from the inclination of... 
Minmus. Uh, one thing that I decided was probably actually very important was to upgrade my tracking sensor to try and get some flight planning. This is because trying to aim for Minmus and its inclined orbit is quite difficult without it. Uh, another thing that I also like to do is sometimes watch my boost stages go and land on their own when my actual spacecraft is up and in stable orbit. And of course once you can start doing things like that it's not a huge conceptual hop, skip and a jump to find yourself with a reusable system or at least a salvageable system. I think that might be a better way of saying it. I mean we could we could totally land this thing but we're not we're not going to drag it back to the Kerbal Space Center and fuel it back up. We're, we're going to recover it. Having put Minic in an equatorial orbit and upgraded my tracking station, I can select Minmus as my target, and this gives me a very handy piece of orbital information on my screen. The thing I'm looking for here are the ascending and descending nodes. These are the points where my orbit intersects the orbital plane of Minmus, meaning that if I was to push up my orbit at one of these points, the apoapsis would reach up and touch Minmus's orbit at a place where we would intersect. Very handy, very handy indeed. Of course, just having those two imaginary circles crossing over at the same point isn't enough. You do have to get there at the same time as well, but the maneuver nodes will help you there. I have managed to get myself a pretty close encounter with Minmus, and using the power of maneuver nodes, I have put myself a maneuver on the very periapsis of that approach. I'm going to then use that maneuver node to make sure that I can stay within the orbit. That is slowing down my relative velocity to Minmus, and we've got ourselves a pretty well captured orbit. I wanted to have a fairly extreme elliptical one so that I could use my slowness at the very, very far point of my orbit bit to be able to change my inclination and then I'm having a little bit of time just mucking around making sure that we are at the ideal height for all the ScanSat equipment. And whilst we're performing those orbital maneuvers and making sure that the Munich has indeed done all the scannings it needs to do and moves on to the multi-spectral, I want to spend this moment to thank every single one of my patrons out there. These are the guys and girls that make sure I keep focused on this game, that when my friends come up to me and be like, yo, Twitchy, do you want to skydive into Columbia, into a nature reserve and go check out some cocaine hippos that Escobar left behind? I'm going to be like, my friends, no, I'm sorry, I can't come out for such casual, casual fun. I need to make sure that I sit down and get this video done for my patrons. So if you could join me in thanking them for making sure this video happens. It's going to take the Minix several in-game days or real-life hours to go around and scan all of the surface of Minmus. So I'm going to go off on a little bit of a development tangent here. I have noticed that on Kerbal we have a variety of tourist missions available to us. Tourist missions that want us to take these civilians up into a suborbital flight over certain parts of the geographical locations of Kerbin. I think this is a great idea. Not only does it get me out and seeing some different parts of Kerbin, it's a bit of easy money. It's not the most uh, lucrative contracts, but they are quite profitable. Especially Especially if I can try and make some sort of reusable system, though this idea very quickly falls by the wayside. In the background you can see that my thought is solid rockets, they are the things that can get us up into a suborbital flight nice and easy. And the problem is that my launch site is not directly underneath the place where we want to be. The launch site is not directly underneath the place I want to be. So maybe if we could fly the solid rocket out to that area, we could then use its rocket-like capabilities as we would underneath it normally. I, uh, those were terrible words, but I hope that you understand what is going on. My first few ideas just really didn't work until I eventually turn it into some sort of plane. It turns out even the combined powers of eight Juno engines, it does not have the power to lift this thing vertically into the sky. So trying to turn this into the plane, the biggest problem that I've got is trying to fit the rear landing gear. The tail plane that I have on the back there it comes out a bit a bit of a weird angle. It's for stability in both directions, plus I just thought it looked a little bit cool. But trying to fit fix the landing gear on the same tank as them really was not working. So I've made some sort of weird sled arrangement underneath. The idea being that we can throw this away, throw this away when we get going up to takeoff speeds. I'm not sure how well it's going to work. I've never really got this type of arrangement to work incredibly well for me. But the biggest problem that we have right now is the fact that I built this in the VAB, not the space plane hangar. That's because I've got an upgraded VAB and we can put plenty of parts in there but the space plane hangar is still fairly low level so we can only get away with 30 parts and this this craft has far more than 30 parts handling is not the greatest it's a uh, very top heavy which means it wants to spin around and uh, lose its center of balance very very easily Jebediah had taken us down to the runway I've decided that Jeb can do a little bit of testing this is fine he jumped in there first and I didn't really mind either way because if I'm to be honest with you this flight is probably gonna get reverted it is just a testing flight. I am developing. I, I've not actually got a tourist on board. We just need to find out what's going on. So the um, the takeoff was a little bit dodgy, but we actually managed to uh, to get ourselves 
airborne without any serious damage to the wings or the tail there. This wasn't the first attempt to do that, uh, but it worked out. Uh, I've now got several objectives that I want to be able to meet during this test flight. The first thing is I want to check its range. I want to see how far it can go. So uh, just to put a little bit of a strain on it, we're going to take it to the back of the mountains, out the back of the Kerbal Space Program, turn around completely. The turn also being part of the testing process because it's quite often that I've built a plane that can fly but doesn't turn very well. In fact, loses so much speed when it turns that it ends up falling out of the sky, as this one nearly does. So we've got the range and we've got the turn. Both of these have worked out. I'm going to fly this down to the island airstrip just opposite us over there. Again, just to make sure we get the range. I don't want to be trying to fly this with a full fuel tank when we actually got take to our solid boosters because that would be a lot of extra weight. Having done the range portion, I've decided that now is the time to push upwards. Uh, I hit the, hit the go on my solid fuel boosters. I pitch up as far as I feel like the airframe can take it. I let it burn to completion and we just stood now and stop and watch the Apple Apps height as we look in horror at it only, only reaching 69 kilometers, not not 70, which would be suborbital. Okay, this 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 is all right. It's not the worst in the world. I'm sure with a little bit of tweaking to our flight profile, maybe burning through a little bit more liquid fuel, rearranging our wings, reducing things like the air intakes on the front, we could make it. But no, no. Let's let's try and make something a bit more powerful. My first idea is, of course, the same plan, but with the kickback booster. This is larger than the thumper booster. Turns out we call it a third. It's not. It's a thumper. Oh, such shame. Inside the plane, uh, this doesn't go well for a variety of reasons. First, the launch pad is just not big enough to support it. This implies me to go out and actually upgrade my space plane hangar, maybe upgrade the uh, the runway as well. But then when we actually deploy this vehicle and go to fly it, it comes off the edge of the runway and it just doesn't, doesn't have the power to lift itself. We're just going to ignore the fact that I even contemplated making an abomination such as this. I put a tricoupler and three hammer solid boosters underneath just to try and get the jet into the air so we could fly without having to face takeoff. Uh, I, yeah, I know, it, it, it did actually work despite what this footage shows you but I, I didn't like it. After much trials and tribulations we ended up with this design. It contains several secrets but I'm gonna have to leave you guys hanging there because I have run out of time and I'm gonna have to say thank you very much for joining me for this adventure in my Kerbal final career. My name's been Twitchy and next time we will definitely be taking some tourists out. We'll be getting started on our station keeping and doing our very best, very very best to explore as much of this solar system as we can. But I'll see you then when we're gonna do that. Bye.